myself really briefly. Um, my name is Mary Jo. Um, I'm a nutritionist. I went did my degree with uh, Amanda in UCD in Dublin, and um, I have a, a master's in personalized nutrition, and I'm also studying uh, nutritional therapy. Uh, so I work a lot with females uh, in female health. I work with women who've got PCOS uh, problems with their period, like PMS, irregular cycles, acne, coming off the pill, uh, and I also support women with weight loss and things like that. So. Uh, yeah, that's just a little bit of a summary about what I do. So what I'm going to talk about today is, um, I'm sure you have a basic understanding of this, um, is the, the menstrual cycle. So the four phases of the cycle, I'm going to break them down and I'm going to uh, use the analogy of the seasons to break each cycle down or each phase of the cycle down. Uh, so winter, spring, autumn, summer and autumn. And um, so that can make it a little bit easier to get to grips with uh, what's happening with the hormone fluctuations uh, when you compare it to the seasons. Uh, so you'll understand what I mean when I go through it anyway uh, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, nutritional um, requirements and what you can do to adjust um, a few things that you can do to adjust um, your, your foods to make to maximize your cycle so I like to think of you taking control of the cycle rather than the cycle can taking control of you and um, so this is just really going to be benefit you and um, whether or not you're exercising but for, for sure if you're exercising because again you can maximize your performance in sport and, and recovery but also just I'm going to touch on like the benefits for your mood your energy and and also for the reduction of PMS which is quite a significant thing that can happen Happen some women every single month and drain the life out of them and they can dread that time of the month as well so I'm going to touch on that and why it's it's common but not normal and that um if you're getting severe PMS that would suggest there's a, a hormonal imbalance occurring and what maybe you need to look at with that so I'm going to start I'm going to share my screen just to show a diagram of the cycle so I have it here We're going to see how full my screen is now. Um, okay, can you all see that there? Yeah, great. Okay, perfect. So this is just a, a very basic diagram of the fluctuations in hormones during the female cycle. Uh, there's a lot of other hormones occurring, but they're not really, um, they don't really need to know about them for this um, chat anyway. So as I said, I'm going to refer to each um, phase of the cycle um, and compare it to the seasons. Okay, so the first phase is, um, the, it's in the follicular phase. So it's um, your period. So day one of the cycle is the first day of your period. So if you look down here, it starts with the red little semicircle, and it usually lasts between uh, one to five days. So uh, three to five days is the normal term. If it's any shorter, there is something maybe amiss. If it's any longer, there could be something amiss there too. So if your period is lasting up to seven or eight days, that again might suggest there's some kind of hormonal imbalance going on. You may not have enough progesterone, for, exa for example. So uh, I'm going to refer to this, uh, the, the period or the menstru menstruation phase of the cycle as winter. OK, so if you think about this on an intuitive level, what kind of happens at winter? You feel a lot more a slow you feel you want to kind of hibernate a little bit more and um, you want to kind of eat a little bit more food you want to chill out in the couch you're not as social you're maybe a little bit more introverted so that is basically due to the the, the drop in hormones as you can see here progesterone is at the very lowest and estrogen is this one here where the my cursor is on is um is just quite slightly low. So during the, the, the very first few days of the cycle, those hormones are very, very low. And during low, low hormone phase, your energy is low, your, um, your mood is low. And it's a great time to just kind of get in tune with your body really. So I like to get clients to maybe journal at this time or meditate at this time. It can be a really good time to get to know yourself because things aren't as busy. You know, it's a time in winter again, you're not, with, it's winter here right now in Ireland and it's really like winter. You know, you can't go outside, it's pissing rain out. So it's a time when you just kind of sit in, you get to know yourself a little bit more. And I don't mean that in a real hippie sense, it needs to be mm, like this or anything. But just to like um, 
get in tune with with the cycle your, your own body a little bit more when it comes to nutrition requirements a few things that i would i would look at here firstly you can utilize carbohydrates slightly better during this phase because even though estrogen and progesterone are at their lowest estrogen is rising slightly during the follicular phase it starts to rise from day one of the period in re in order to prepare for ovulation at day 14 so from day one to day 14 your estrogen is rising so your body is able to utilize carbohydrates more efficiently at this time so um you can eat carb i'd reckon i'd suggest if you're trying to cycle sync in terms of nutrition like having a little bit more carbohydrates during this phase i'd also suggest during the first one to five days of your cycle to really up your anti-inflammatory foods the reason for this is especially for women who might suffer with severe cramping or anything like that um anti-inflammatory foods foods will reduce prostaglandins that give rise to the painful periods so think of um your oily fish your nuts and seeds your fruits and vegetables those type of foods are it may seem basic but they can make a big difference if you're eating more of that those during your cycle as opposed to eating more inflammatory fried fatty foods eating more of them is going to give rise to more painful periods um also reducing your caffeine intake and your salt intake and alcohol intake. All of these can, again, trigger um, painful periods. Salt intake will give rise to a bit more fluid retention. So for anyone who suffers with bloating at this time of the cycle, your salt intake is quite so is something to look at. Uh, so if you're eating a lot of salty food, so, you know, processed pizzas, chips, things like that, baby's things to avoid and look at your more whole foods and um, to reduce that, that occurring. Caffeine, again, can be a trigger for both painful periods, uh, loose bowels at this time, and also might give rise to anxiety because your hormones particularly your progesterone and progesterone has a very anti-anxiety effect but we need to have that in place so at that time it isn't there to protect us as such so you may notice you're feeling a little bit more anxious and just a little bit out of sorts so adding things like alcohol and caffeine can kind of trigger those kind of feelings so that would be what I'd say in terms of nutrition at this phase of the cycle now in terms of exercise this is something that's very dependent on each individual some women find they just want to chill out others find exercise helps the benefits of exercise at this time of the cycle are exercise is anti-inflammatory it releases endorphins that are going to make you feel good so it does make sense to do some form of movement so it doesn't have to be as intense as what you would do say midway through your cycle but doing some form of movement is important at this time of the cycle so I'd always suggest to kind of try it what I'm going to say on a general level here is everyone needs to try and listen to their own body. What I'm saying is based on, you know, research that's out there on groups of women, but each woman is uniquely different. So, you know, do try and get in tune with your own body as well. But what I would say is if you are to go out and do some form of physical activity and um, do what suits you. So whether that be um, a, a walk, a long walk in nature and um, yoga, Pilates, swimming or cycling, they may be less impactful and they need less recovery depending on how intense you go. But I'd probably encourage going a little bit less intense based on the fact that you don't have, your hormones are not supportive of recovery at this time. So estrogen is an anabolic hormone or growth hormone and helps you recover, but that's quite low at the moment. So if you're doing passionate, lots of um, high intense exercise in gym, for example, you don't have that recovery um, hormone to, to get you back to, um, to really help you recover basically optimally. So I'd encourage at this time to be a little bit less impactful in your, in your exercises, low impact, less intense, and kind of just doing some form of movement, more for the anti-inflammatory benefits and to release the good endorphins to help you feel good. So that's just the phase one of the cycle so the winter phase of the cycle think of winter as your cold time of the year well it is in Ireland as you know most of you so that it's cold and you just want to sit in chill out and just you know relax a little bit you mightn't be as extroverted as I say and again that's your body telling you just to kind of sit in at home and just eat a little bit more it's okay if you put on a little bit of weight I don't mean lots of body fat but just a little bit of fluid retention can occur during this time and again Amanda you probably always say this to people it's not fat most likely most of this weight during this time of the cycle is fluid retention and if this is something that you experience 
definitely upping your fruit, veg, your anti-inflammatory foods and reducing your processed inflammatory and salty foods from your diet and obviously up in your water. Another thing I like to introduce for people at this phase is um, some soothing teas like chamomile or ginger tea. I drink ginger tea quite regularly and I'm drinking it now. So I just slice up some fresh ginger and put it in uh, warm water. This is very, uh, there's actually been more studies looking into this and, and its effects on reducing pain in the body and lots of different issue, diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis and um, and things like that but it can be helpful for reducing the pa painful periods so if this is something that you suffer with again uh, drinking chamomile or ginger tea during this time can be nice and soothing on both your digestive tract and your um the uterus as well so we're moving on now so by the way just to note i have this down as 28 day cycle but just to be aware not every woman has this uh, length of cycle and that is normal as well it can range between 28 and around 35 days and there's even more studies now being done showing that it can go beyond that and that's still considered normal I suppose optimally you want to have between 28 and 35 days so for you know regular um ovulation and and that kind of thing so if you're looking for optimal health in terms of like fertility and a regular cycle you kind of want to keep it in between the, the 28 and 35 days okay so i'm moving on now to the uh, the next phase so this is the spring phase and it's we're still in the follicular phase of the cycle and just to note the reason it's called the follicular phase is because there is a hormone called follicle stimulating hormone that is starting to rise more and more and it's basically um making more follicles on your ovaries develop in order to release an egg from your ovary when it comes to ovulation. So we're still in the follicular phase and we're at springtime now, okay? So I suppose when you think about spring, you're starting to think about more, you're more hopeful, you're more excited about what's to come. Um, the days are getting a little bit longer, you're feeling a little bit more energized, um, and you want to get out there a little bit more. Again, the reason for this um, when it comes down to a biological level is, your um your body wants you to go out and meet people to reproduce and uh, have sex basically because you're going to have an egg soon um, being released from the ovaries and that's what your body wants you to do but the benefits of this are great because the right you can see how much estrogen is rising here now so this big surge in estrogen is really going to influence your mood so it's going to help you it's going to increase your libido it's going to increase your energy levels it's going to just in increase how you're feeling overall again nutrition wise it's again we can utilize carbohydrates quite efficiently at this point of the cycle so um because estrogen makes your muscles more sensitive to uh, insulin. So that means then that a little bit more carbohydrates that we're eating will be up will be uptaken into the cells to be used as fuel more quickly than it would say at other phases of the cycle. So that's just something to note. This, it, however, that probably will be quite dependent on your, your personal, um, say for example, you are either diabetic or PCOS, this may not be as relevant to you. You still would need to manage your carbohydrates in terms of keeping them to complex and you know, um, having smaller portions with your, your three meals in the day. But if, if this isn't relevant to you in terms of PCOS or type two diabetic, then you, you can utilize carbohydrates for fuel a little bit more. The good thing about this phase as well is you can do more on less. So you're doing a little bit more exercise. So you're using up that energy as well from the extra carbohydrates too. Um, and you, as I say, your appetite may not be as high either. So you're doing more on less. So this is a good time. I like to, to you know, reduce a little bit of calories. Uh, you may not notice, you might, may not just even be thinking about food as much. And the reason for this is your body is priming you for reproduction rather than fuel. So it wants you to actually think about going out there and meeting a mate rather than getting um rather than looking for food so that if you think in hunter gatherer times instead of going uh hunting for food you're actually going out looking for someone to to mate with as such so there that's the reason why your appetite can actually be a little bit more suppressed at this time due to the estrogen levels really it's more of an appetite suppressant so another thing I like to note, okay, and this is important, particularly if you get PMS issues and you need to be thinking about PMS, not the week of your, before your period, all through the month of your cycle. The way, the, how, your, how bad your PMS is going to be is how you are from day one of your period. So the, how PMS occurs, to try and explain this as briefly and quickly as possible, 
if you, I will explain it more when we get to the, the other phase of the cycle. So I, I'll wait till then. So I just want to talk about estrogen. You don't want your estrogen being too high. And the reason for that is high levels of estrogen can lead to, um, you, you get more of a drop off and that drop off can really give a crash for some women. So what you want to do with estrogen is making sure that you're metabolizing and removing it efficiently. So your liver and your gut are responsible for that. So during the follicular phase or the spring phase of the cycle, it's really important to look after your liver health. And we should be doing this at all phases of the cycle, but again, upping like um, cruciferous vegetables such as broccoli, cauliflower, sprouts, uh, things like that, they'll really support the liver to um, detoxify the excess estrogen because they contain a compound called DIM and DIM can remove um, this excess estrogen. So um, also then at your gut level, maybe adding in some more um, prebiotic and probiotic foods like sauerkraut, natural yogurt with live bacteria in it, um, Prebiotic foods are like asparagus, even like um, the green bananas, they contain a bit more prebiotics in them. So things like that. And obviously just up in your water intake and keeping your alcohol moderate. So alcohol is always deemed as priority by the liver because it's a drug, it's a toxin deemed by the body. So it will remove alcohol before any other compound like estrogen. So that can give rise to higher estrogen levels than if you're drinking more alcohol. So just to be aware of that as well. So I'm not saying don't drink alcohol, but just to be aware of that. And then if you are to really help support the, the flushing out of the liver, supporting the liver to detoxify the, the alcohol, drinking lots of water, very, very important. And the, your green crystal cruciferous vegetables and then um, your prebiotics and your probiotics to support your gut health to do the, the second phase of detoxification of the of estrogen. So I hope that ex explains kind of the, uh, the nutrition requirements for phase one of the cycle and phase two, so winter and spring. Um, in terms of exercise, you'll probably notice that you're, as your energy is rising during the follicular phase and in, in springtime, you're going to be able to do a lot more unless as I say so it's a great time to really push yourself in whatever exercise you do whether it's your gym your swimming your running whatever that is push yourself you have the energy you have a bit more stamina you have the recovery hormones there to support you as well so definitely a good time to um to look into that as well so now we're moving into phase three which is halfway point ovulation estrogen is at its peak at this time so again I come back to really up in your anti-inflammatory foods to help support the detoxification of this estrogen so uh, again I spoke about anti-inflammatory foods fruit vegetables nuts and seeds oily fish things like that are really going to help support the metabolism of that, of that excess estrogen um, so what's happening at this phase of the cycle? You are just reaching the pivotal point where you are releasing an egg from the ovary. So this, in my opinion, and um, most hormone specialists and fertility specialists will talk about this, is the crescendo moment of the cycle and it's the main event of the female cycle. We often think it's your period. Your period only results as um, a result of ovulation. If you don't ovulate, you will not get a period. So this has to occur in order for you to get a period. So ovulation is so important because it start, It makes estrogen again, it makes more estrogen and it makes progesterone. So I'm going to talk now about progesterone and this is occurring in your autumn phase of the cycle. So the luteal phase. And during, and it starts to rise during this phase. The reason this is so, so important, progesterone, is because it does many beneficial things, but it's an anti, it's like nature's Valium. It's very, it's anti-anxiety, it's soothing, it's calming, it relaxes your nervous system. Um, and it supports bone health, it supports hair health, it supports your thyroid function. If you're not making this hormone, you work over time. So if you're not ovulating every month regularly, over time, if this is becoming consistent, it is going to catch up with you in some form or other, whether it's heart issues, bone health, thyroid issues, even your hair and your skin, all of these things can start to um it can start to manifest this way. So it's I can't emphasize how important it is that you're making this hormone. Progesterone is also important for a healthy pregnancy as well. So you know we need it's very important in all aspects, whether you're trying to get pregnant or not. Um so this is coming now to the PMS issue. Okay, so 
what it happens after ovulation, you can see here the estrogen is just slowly dro dropping there and it's going to a low point. For some women, they can really feel that. So that can be a crash in energy just after ovulation. It can be feeling irritable, a little bit moody, and they're just not themselves. So what happens is, as you can see here, progesterone starts to rise after that, after ovulation. So while estrogen is dropping, your progesterone is rising. So if you're making enough progesterone, this should shield you from the effects of that estrogen crash, okay? If you're really feeling those estrogen crashes, that will be a sign that you're not making enough progesterone. So I'm gonna talk about now why you may not be making enough progesterone. The, the, the two areas to look at, firstly, before even going to nutrition, is your lifestyle. What is your sleep and what is your stress levels like? Stress steals progesterone production. Think of it like a fork in the road. If there's stress in your body, um, stress hormones are made, um, all our sex hormones and stress hormones are made from cholesterol. So cholesterol is here and then it has a choice to make. If there's more stress in the body, it's going to go make cortisol and progesterone is not going to be made. However, if we've got less stress in our body and we're feeling calm and relaxed, it's not going to make cortisol and it's going to go and make progesterone. So it's kind of like it has to make a choice and one of them is going to be impacted and you don't want that to be progesterone. Cortisol is a stress hormone. We don't want that too high at all. So we want to be making more progesterone in your cycle. So look at your stress levels firstly. If you're not sleeping well, your body's not going to be is able to cope with stress. So it's really important that you're sleeping well. And then the other thing is your, your diet. Are you eating enough firstly? Are you getting enough starchy carbohydrates? Are you getting enough healthy fats? Are you getting magnesium and B vitamins in your diet? They're very, very important. So during this phase of the cycle, you can up your starchy vegetables and um, things that contain B vitamins. So um, yeah, like leafy greens, quinoa, buckwheat, things like that, because they help to make more serotonin. And your serotonin is um, a neurotransmitter that makes you feel good and a little bit calmer and more relaxed. And it also helps to make GABA, which is another neurotransmitter, which helps support the nervous system, help you sleep better and help you feel more relaxed. Up in your magnesium intake too. So getting your, this is why I'd always say dark chocolate is great at this time. So 70% or more, it's really good source of magnesium. Magnesium basically manufactures progesterone and GABA, which is going to help you feel calmer and relaxed. And it also, you get that from spinach and nuts like, uh, and seeds like pumpkin seeds. So that's just a little bit on the nutrition requirements at this phase of the cycle. So um, in terms of recovery, this phase of the cycle, progesterone is what's called a catabolic hormone. And without knowing what that means, basically, it doesn't uh, optimize recovery. It, it actually can go against recovery. So it's nearly breaking down muscles. So that's not what you want to happen. So it's better to um, adjust your exercise at this time. So um, if you're doing, say, weight, bearing exercise, resistant exercise three or four times a week, perhaps reducing that down to two times and also upping your nutrition, upping your calories in general, upping your protein intake and upping your fat intake because you need these for recover, recovery uh, more than ever because you don't have the help of your hormones at this phase of the cycle. And also your blood sugar levels are very much dysregulated. So they're more prone to dysregulation at this phase of the cycle due to the fluctuations in hormones. So it's really important to help stabilize. Where's the clot? It's really important to, to, to stabilize them by eating a little bit more regularly and um, eating a little bit more proteins and healthy fats. So that's how you would do that at that phase of the cycle. So just when I wanted to talk about the, the PMS, so the reason PMS occurs is when you're not making enough progesterone because the, the, the common PMS symptoms that a lot of women experience are cravings, they are irritability, low mood, anxiety, depression. And they, they, some women can find them very debilitating and that would be a sign that something is amiss. So when it comes to uh, to a hormone imbalance you're really looking at how much did you ovulate and how much progesterone you're making because even after you ovulate you can make progesterone but it can be stolen as i said to make stress hormones and um, so so many factors can influence your stress it can be if you're drinking a lot of alcohol if you've got a high caffeine intake if you're doing too much exercise at this phase of the cycle if you're not sleeping enough if you're not putting yourself first at times and you're constantly saying yes to other people and not saying no for your own needs all of these things can trigger 
PMS, believe it or not. So it's so, so important to get in tune with what might be upsetting you at each phase of the cycle. So it's important to obviously look at your nutrition, improve your nutrition, up your calories at this phase, get lots of good lean proteins in and anti-inflammatory fats are going to be important for blood sugar stabilization at this phase and to reduce inflammation that will occur during the later phase when you get your period again. But also to look at other factors that might be influencing PMS. So what emotional issues are going on in your life that can massively affect your PMS? Um, and what are you saying in yes to that maybe you need to put say no to, to put yourself first, not doing too much exercise and um, not staying out too late. And and like obviously there's life happens, these things happen. You can't always be in tune with your cycle. But it's just to be aware, like I know uh, a lot of women now after Christmas start to notice that their cycle is a little bit different because they've upped a lot of alcohol during Christmas, a lot more processed and inflammatory foods. So myself, I'm getting myself nearly ready for the PMS that's going to come in my cycle this month because of that, because it kind of occurs a month later. So really, like I spent I'm eating a lot more anti-inflammatory foods, I'm really upping my oily fish intake, drinking lots of herbal teas, lots of fruits and veg to kind of combat that issue and really looking after my sleep and stress because otherwise I know it's kind of nearly going to come I'll be feeling more anxious irritable low fatigue the fatigue can be quite either debilitating for some and all of that is to do just with the 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 impact of the the drop in estrogen and then the low progesterone so basically you don't want the gap between estrogen and progesterone to be too big so if you see here they're kind of they're not too far apart from each other in that graph at the last phase of the cycle. So they're, they're not too far apart. If your estrogen was down here, that would be the issue. And that's what can occur for some women as if they have estrogen down here and they just are not making enough progesterone. So it, it's you want the gap to be close enough together in order to not have these big symptoms um, in, in your PMS. So I think I could be going over time. I'm sorry, Amanda. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think though that's pretty much everything that I wanted to kind of cover. What do you think? Is that like I can keep going if you want me to, but I think that's kind of the basics that I wanted to cover. A you're little not, bit touching on, on you're nutrition. You're not going over time at all, by the way. So don't be worrying oh. about that. Don't be worrying. No, you're not going over time at all. Good. Okay, good. But look, I think that's mainly what I wanted to cover to keep it basic and to, um, I hope that like simplified a little bit about the phases of the cycle. So winter is your period, spring is your estrogen is rising, it's your follicular phase and you're feeling a little bit more hopeful. Summertime is ovulation. Ovulation is when your energy is at its peak, your sex drive is at its peak. Obviously this is the time if you want to plan for a pregnancy to, to look into that. So you'd want to be having sex about five days before you ovulate in order for you to have a viable egg and uh, meet sperm. So sperm can survive in the female body for five days. So you want to be having sex about five days before you ovulate. That's just something to know if anyone here is thinking about that or just, just even for yourselves in terms of um, a contraceptive way, because a lot of us don't realise that, that it's actually six days of the cycle is the times that we can get pregnant. It's not the 28 days. It's not actually possible unless you've got an egg. So if you're regu ovulating regularly and you know when you ovulate, then it's around that time frame, the six days that you can get pregnant. It's not the whole time of the cycle, which we're kind of led to believe when we're in secondary school that fear, sex, you're going to get pregnant all of the time. It's actually not true. And it's really false information. And it actually encourages a lot of women to go on the pill out of fear. Without, and they don't have that education to know that it's actually only six days in the cycle that you really need to be careful. And if you're unsure of your ovulation, that's a really good, important thing to, to note and to start tracking. So just to note this, if you're not sure what ovulation looks like, you're going to see a rise in... Um, fertile mucus five days before you ovulate. So this kind of mucus, I hope you're not squeamish, but it's like a stretchy, slippery egg white. So this allows an, a sperm to survive under those conditions if you've got that kind of uh, mucus. And then obviously, um, you, you may notice uh, ovulation pain on either side of your abdomen. Some women can notice that. Uh, but the most accurate and important indicator is the rise in basal body temperature. So you won't notice this yourself. It's not like you're suddenly going to feel hotter. But if, you're, if you really want to get to know your cycle and track, uh, I'd recommend taking your temperature 
during um, the month using a basal body thermometer. So during the first phase here, one to 14, your temperature is at a normal body temperature. After you ovulate due to the rise in progesterone, you're gonna to start to see a 0.5 um, increase in your basal body temperature due to the rise in progesterone, which boosts your thyroid hormone, which kind of boosts your temperature and your metabolism. So you'll start to notice a temperature rise and that's an indicator that you've ovulated because the only way to make progesterone is if you ovulate. So that's something just to note if you want to kind of get more in tune with your cycle, if you actually are ovulating. Very, very important to know these for so many reasons for both nutrition requirements or sports, but also if you're planning to conceive, if you're not planning to conceive and you want to avoid pregnancy, knowing these bits of information can tell you so much about your body. So I, I find it's a really important education that women should know about that I don't think a lot of us do because we've been on birth control, say for a lot of our early 20s, which has completely flatlined our hormones. We've never had to get to know our hormones because of that. So, um, and, and I don't know if you know this or not, and I'm just going to say it, the pill is not a real period. You don't make hormones when you're on the pill. You don't make progesterone at all. And it's a completely different type of estrogen that's in the pill that you make in your own body yourself. So just to be aware of that, if you do think your pill is a period, it's actually not. Nothing wrong with the pill. I'm not saying that you need to come off or anything, but just to be aware, it's not a real cycle. That's all. I just want to give that information out there because some women still don't know this. So yeah, I think I'm going to leave it at that because I could go on loads of different rants around that. But um, I hope that was helpful and I'm happy to take any questions at all. Um, I'm going to jump in first and say, I'm sorry for not introducing you properly, by the way, um, but you did a great <laughs> job at introducing yourself. So that actually worked out okay. I was like trying to get the like Facebook Live thing going and I was just like, I just totally didn't introduce her. So I just want no, to- No, it's really stressful in your host, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, secondly, I just want to say how- absolutely incredible that information was um Mary Jo like you know obviously we studied nutrition in college together and um, this is all still a learning curve for me and um, so having you on today is just absolutely phenomenal like I've just learned so much from that um from that uh, presentation so I'm sure the women here have definitely learned a lot um seeing as like I actually I knew some of the stuff coming in you know so this is yeah. really definitely be, been super super helpful um oh I gosh. have a couple of questions um okay. and I'm sure the floor will be open as well to be honest because it, and if it's if there is any questions ladies leave this to the um to you know the specialist like Mary Jo is amazing in this field like I'm still really learning about this area and um, I'm by no means like know it all um, and that's why I got Mary Jo on and that's why I wanted her to talk to you about it so if you do have questions don't like have them in your head no no question is a stupid question always remember that it might be something individual to you or it might be just a broad question but oh, please, please, please do get asking. So I'm going to go forward with a few of my questions, Mary Jo. Um, yeah. So um, the first one is you talked a lot about, you know, anti-inflammatory foods and stuff, um, and especially like maybe during the menstrual cycle. And I know a lot of people out there, um, they'll want to eat, you know, they're, it's easy to just get a takeaway. I feel sorry for myself, you know, yeah. I, I have period pains, blah, 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 etc. cetera. Um, yeah. And don't get me wrong. I know like sometimes you're not going to give in to these things, but maybe if you just like tell people how important it is to, you know, like, as opposed to going for the cravings and feeling like you have to go for them crappy foods, go for loads of chocolate, how important it actually is for those cramps, for PMS, et cetera, to actually reach for the healthier options. Now, I know people don't want to hear this, guys, but it is an important thing to know. Yeah, like the first thing I would say, if someone is, as I said, suffering with very either severe PMS or severe cramps, that, in my opinion, and a lot of other people's opinion now would be not normal. It's common, but that doesn't mean it's normal. So, like, we should run through our cycle with fairly good ease. Like, it's a tra transition fairly uh, smoothly, and we shouldn't feel really debilitated. So that's just the first thing I'd note. So, if, for example, if you're so fatigued that you can't cook, like that's actually not normal. Do you know what I mean? You shouldn't be that bad. So that would be first thing I'd look at and to see what's going on there. So yeah, like, I mean, if you're looking, there's no point in, in saying eating 
bad say all month long then it comes to your period and trying to eat anti-inflammatory foods because you're just going to have a bad period then as a result of that and you're going to have zero motivation it's kind of like what you do all month long and so this isn't meaning you can't get a takeaway like during the month of course not like you can and you can go out as well and drink or whatever but it's kind of what you're doing say 80 percent of the time so if during the month you're being consistent with your nutrition and your exercise it's actually going to really really help your cycle when you get to it so that you're not so debilitated to the point that you can't start maybe consider making a healthy meal for example but yeah like the likes of eating a takeaway um while it might seem comforting at the time um it's easy and it's going to be tasty it's going to give you a little bit of salt and uh, which you might think you're craving due to a little bit of the fluid retention it might be just that you need water that's but you need the salts from the water that's what you need it's not actually salts from you maybe need to up your magnesium too which is a mineral in itself so important that you're you're getting foods like that I still would encourage comfort food, but like nutritious comfort food. So comfort food that contains um, like starchy carbohydrates and even your regular carbohydrates. There's nothing wrong with, you know, putting on like a good few spuds or homemade big chips. Bowl of pasta. Yourself, big bowl of pasta, yeah. something like that. And then like, yeah, that would be a great one to have with say um, beef mints. Because again, if you're not vegetarian, especially um, if you wanted to have beef mints, because you are losing a little bit of iron. Some women intuitively crave a little bit of red meat at this time of the cycle, just because of the loss of iron. So um, yeah, that'd be like a bolognese or something like that. So, you you know even if you know that during your period you're you feel a little bit more fatigued and sluggish perhaps using that like sense of information to plan ahead and prep your meal for the week of your period so you know maybe making a big batch of spaghetti bolognese or um something like that in advance but yeah the anti you when you um or getting your period we do naturally make more prostaglandins okay but like and the reason we make them is to kind of make the uterus contract to basically shed the, the uterine lining so it's natural process but it's when there's a high level of those it causes an awful lot of spasm and cramp and and um yeah spasms in the, in the uterus which is what gives rise to those very those really painful periods so the likes of magnesium is very beneficial for reducing spasms so it helps with muscle spasms as well so it helps with the uterine lining and reduces the spasms there so again really up in your leafy green vegetables pumpkin seeds and dark chocolate and if your periods are really bad uh, you could look at a magnesium supplement as well. I do recommend magnesium supplements for women who suffer with bad PMS and uh, painful periods. Um, again, do if you're if you're if you want to ask me about that, I'd um I can give you some recommendations. Don't just go out to a, a normal health so store and get a magnesium supplement. There's so many different forms. It's important to get the right format. Um, and then anti-inflammatory foods. So basically like there's kind of like i'm going to simplify this as best as i can there's two different pathways in the body pro-inflammatory anti-inflammatory pro-inflammatory foods increase those prostaglandins so they make them they aggravate them as such and they make more of them and you're kind of like basically putting a bear in there and fighting with what you've already got and really aggravating the situation you don't want to do that so you want to be bringing in more soothing and anti-inflammatory things so soothing herbs are like ginger and chamomile soothing foods are like your anti-inflammatory foods um, and and they don't have to be oily fish if that's not something that you enjoy great if you do but just fruit and vegetables nuts and seeds and things like that so snacking on your nuts and seeds like oat cakes and hummus oat cakes and nut butter uh, something like that as a snack as as opposed to you know reaching for a bag of crisp and chocolate which is just not going to fuel you fuel you and it's not going to make you feel much better down the line so that's kind of what i say does that cover that question yeah Amanda? absolutely and i and you covered it i think you covered it great anyway but you said that you know if you are having serious issues with pms it, it isn't a normal thing you know that it's yeah. common but it's not necessarily a normal thing and maybe that is something that you need to go to a specialist like yourself about um or yeah. something like that so i and that yeah. was perfect and to be honest um the actual question of the pro and anti-inflammatory foods was kind of um answered there as well about um you know as you said making the prostaglandins worse and uh, making then it's actually going to have an in, in a, 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 a 
disadvantage to your body yeah. as opposed to an advantage where you think you're going to get it. Um, yeah. Brilliant stuff. Um, this, this, the other thing I just say on that is that you do crave more at this time of the cycle because your blood sugars are more dysregulated. So that's why I'd always say eat more firstly, eat more regularly and eat more protein and fat to keep your blood sugars regulated. This will really help with the cravings. So up when you're like, you know, say for example, I'm just going to give an average day. You're going to have your wake up in the morning. Make sure you have a high protein breakfast. So whether that be two to three eggs with a little bit of you know wholemeal bread or wholemeal uh, or oat bread or something like that, and um, a little bit of butter or avocado, something to get some fats in there, and you could sprinkle some seeds on as well. You really want to be up in your nutrients at this stage. Then for snack time, you can have you can up your snacks at this stage. So I'd say have a good handful of nuts and a piece of fruit. Even that in itself will help you. Or a few dates and peanut butter. You want to be just keeping your blood sugars regulated throughout this time more so than you would in the early follicular phase because they're more susceptible to uh, dysregulation. It's that dysregulation in blood sugars that leads to the crashes and the cravings. And they're like, oh my God, I need chocolate. Like, it's not that it's in your head that you need that. It is, it's a physiological need, but you have to look at, are you nourishing yourself optimally? Because, you know, you could skip breakfast and then be like, oh, why am I so hungry? And then it's like, okay, you need to be up in your fuel intake and your nutrient intake and your calories at this time. So, I would say eating every three to four hours, three meals, two snacks, and that will really help curb those cravings. It doesn't have to be, if you're conscious of calories and you know weight loss, it doesn't have to be high, high energy foods. Um, and it doesn't have to be, um, you, you know, it, you don't have to eat loads either, but it's just that regular eating can really keep the blood sugar level stable. And just think about it. If you're trying to lose weight and you're trying to cut back on food and you think you're doing yourself well, I guarantee, and like maybe for most women this occurs, you'll end up giving into cravings at some point because your body wants the fuel. So you're better off eating more nutritious food more regularly and often than, than cutting out a nutritious meal and then giving into a pizza and chocolate and ice cream that night and going on an overeating binge because that will occur because your body wants more fuel. So just to be aware of that, um, I hope that makes sense. That's a great point. Really, really good. Thank you, MJ. Um, the next question then for me is, um, you mentioned a pain in um, a, a pain in your abdomen, maybe around an ovulation time. This was just somebody something that was um, said to me before, and it's not something I'm very well aware of, to be honest. Um, you know, there might be a little bit of pain there. Is it normal or common to have severe pain during ovulation? Severe pain, no, it wouldn't be. Um, so you'd, you'd get like a slight twinge. Mm -hmm. Some women, not every woman does, yeah. get a slight twinge. Mm -hmm. uh, severe, and severe pain during ovulation. And is it always an ovulation? Yeah. That, uh, if you're not washing it at this point, um, you wash it off, maybe chop it. Sorry. Uh, is it, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think, that wouldn't be normal, firstly. It could be, um, it might be something to get checked out because yeah. it perhaps could be like a cyst on the ovary. Nothing serious. It's quite common to get some cysts on the ovary that just need to be uh, reduced, for yeah. example, or a bit of uh, medication can help reduce those. Um, but that could be something to consider. No, it wouldn't be normal to get severe pain to the point that like you're like doubled over. Yeah. You can get a twinge and it's just kind of like, a yeah, but I, that would be it. Like that would be what you'd be expecting at that yeah. stage. Yeah. It was something that I hadn't heard of and something that I thought was unusual. So that's why I just wanted yeah, to Yeah, it would be unusual. It. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. The last question then, and you touched on it quite a bit, um, and you probably said a lot of this, um, but I, I, I'm very big on this and I talk to people um, about this all the time. And, you know, look, uh, everybody likes the easier um, answer and um, the biggest answer in nutrition being it depends and people absolutely hate that I know. <laughs> um, and like we are all so different when it comes to like things like stress on the body and I know you really touched on it um, but it's something that is just so important to be aware of um, yeah. and that stress isn't just when you feel stressed and I spoke to yeah. individuals about this before you know I actually uh, and I think that they thought that I was absolutely ludicrous you 
you know, they, they felt that they weren't losing weight. They couldn't understand their calories were low. I know their calories yeah. were low. They were definitely in a deficit. Um, we got into it a little bit more. I realized that um, they were consuming way too much coffee. Their caffeine intake was huge. They were under the stress of moving house, even though you don't necessarily feel like it's a massive stress. It's a big change yeah. in your life. It is a stressor. And I just wanted, um, I suppose, I, I don't even need probably you to, um, but you can back me up here on just yeah, 100%. explaining how important and how like people really neglect it. And I, I always hate this idea of, oh, it's just a matter of calories in versus calories out. And it's just not that simple. And MG, I know that you can definitely back me up here and saying that it's not just as simple as that no. all the time. I mean, when you think of stress, I think even like myself, like years ago, when someone would have asked me, are you stressed? I would be like, no, because I would have thought stress meant like a trauma event or something yeah. really bad happening. But it isn't like we all have like a cup basically in our body that like has a, a threshold for stress. But like we get to a point where that cup can get overburdened and I can start spilling out and that's when it can manifest in like different issues with your health but like it does stress does not have to look like you know I don't know the, the real trauma events that you might think stress is it really is like just even things like just poor sleep is stress because you're not basically building up resilience for your body to cope and um, you know fam like at the moment I don't know it's different in Australia but in Ireland a lot of mums are homeschooling and trying to do a job that is stressful like like it's really hard like what they have to do like try to work while also teach their kids like it's very hard and they're all at home at the same time and like there's no kind of end sight for them or anything so that's very stressful on them and um, and that's if you're running your own business that can be stressful your job can be stressful family situations can be stressful a fight with your partner can be stressful and if these are happening consistently that's going to put a massive stress in your body you're raising basically you've got your adrenal glands which raise two hormones adrenaline and cortisol and that's great you want them because they help you run away from danger when you need to but unfortunately our brain doesn't know the difference between danger and a fight with your husband or your partner and um it's your ability, I suppose, to, to process stress and have a bit more resilience. So I always like to think of, you can't stop stress from happening, like those kind of family issues and things. That's just life, okay? But it's when they're happening all the time that they can put stress in the body. But like what we do to our bodies can really help. So if you're looking after your sleep, that can help you. And if you're eating well, that can help you. If you're exercising to a moderate amount, not over exercising too, because that's stressful as well. So, um, it, and again, this does depend. Some people can take on more exercise than others. And it's just, it's finding what works for you. And it's, that's why it's always important to stay in tune with your own body. But exercise can help because it reduces, uh, it increases good feeling hormones and makes you feel a bit better and counteracts the stressful hormones. Um, but those are three things to firstly look at if you're stressed. Are you sleeping enough? Are you eating enough? And are you um, doing a little more enough exercise to support you? Um, you can also kind of bring in some more um, mindful work then so to start working on uh, and like I'm not an expert in this field and like I only practice these things as myself so I can say on an anecdotal level from work with myself and clients that they can help but you need to find what works for you like journaling can work for some people amazingly yoga can work for some women amazingly meditation can be great even just like it doesn't have to be those particular stress things it could be just calling a friend that you haven't chatted to in ages and getting a little bit of you know just talking to someone else having a laugh that can be one of the best things you can do go out for, I, I know I've just been saying not to go out and drink but sometimes going out with your friends and having a good time can be just what you need as well to reduce stress so it's just about finding what's right for you in that time too so I do encourage to get to know your body but um the main three things to look at there is your sleep your calories are you eating enough and, you, if you're, and your exercise levels that you're making sure you're doing enough but not too much so yeah <laughs> brilliant Mary Jo absolutely brilliant I'm gonna reiterate what you said and I do say it to a lot of you out there you've definitely heard me say this every single day you should have something it might only be 10 minutes nobody's asking you to give an hour to it I know you're all busy I know some of your mothers nobody's saying you need to give an hour but every single day you should have something that is for you you should have something yeah. that's for Joel something that's for Anna something that's for Mary Jo like every single person should have something every single day that you said was for you now uh, I try to say that that's exercise but 
it can be something else. I, I started giving my 30 minutes of TV a day. And I know that that's a thing that people would say that's actually bad for you. But for me, it is something that relaxes me. I sit down, I enjoy it. It's not something I got to do at home because I was too busy, um, but that was my own fault. Uh, but every single day, 10, 15 minutes, if you can give it a half an hour, brilliant, but you should always have something for you every single day. That's yeah, all my absolutely. questions, Mary Jo. Sorry, I know I took up a lot of time there, but... Um, no, no worries. I, I'm going to look. There's a question that came in there on a, a hormone contraceptive. I'm just having a look at it now. Um, I can't get back to it now, actually. Sorry. Here we are. Um, okay, so... As far as I'm aware, this is a progestin um, only contraception. Uh, that can affect your ability to ovulate. Um, so that's why you wouldn't have had a period. So while it doesn't directly stop ovulation, when you don't make progesterone, you can your body's basically like, what is happening? So it stops ovulating. Um, so you get you can see each one a drop of blood only okay so you're getting really really light periods if you do think so okay yeah like but this is like when it comes to contraceptive it's quite a it's can be a, it's a topic that it's very dependent on the person and you need to find out what's right for you like I mean contraception is great because it can take stress away if you want to be able to have a enjoyable sex life without worrying about getting pregnant so that's like the really good benefits of it the downsides of it is is you are shutting off your hormones and you're not making enough you're not making your own estrogen estradiol and progesterone um and i did i had a chat about this with someone there and like you know there's a lot of uh, the, the any sort of contraception contraception sorry depletes your nutrients and um, you metabolize um, your your nutrients a lot more quickly and you may not you may be excreting a lot of them more in your urine for example and um, you're also as you're not making your own um progesterone you're not getting the benefits of for bone health which is so important for women especially when we do come off the the contraception we need that protective effects for reducing the risk of like osteoporosis so it really helps to keep our bone mineral density up when we make our own hormones so like and you're asking me what I think um I think that you have to do what's right for you but if you're not comfortable with the fact that you're not making your own hormones perhaps looking at another um form of contraception and um, like there you know most hormonal hormonal contraceptions will stop you from uh, having a period the copper coil um doesn't stop you from ovulating it can cause very heavy bleeds but it doesn't stop you ovulating so from that point of view it's probably one of the good ones um i don't know if you want to maybe message me afterwards because it's a bit more of a, a chat that i need to have with someone do you know what i mean so for who that person was just to even get me on instagram if you're on instagram you can message me on instagram afterwards is that saying okay? i will i will actually put a link to your instagram and all so they can ask that question because i think that that is very individual there's a lot of issues and elements to talk about there it's totally, not just yeah, a very yeah. gener general question yeah so the best anti-inflammatory foods that I'd recommend, okay, so if you're a fan of oily fish, definitely get those in. So uh, think of it like smash. So sardines, mackerel, anchovies, yes, um, M -A -S -M -A -S. salmon, uh, what's the other one? S and H is salmon. herring, salmon. salmon. Oh, the obvious one that everyone <laughs> actually eats, like, yeah, the, the one that people actually eat. Yeah, so they would be the, the really good um anti-inflammatory foods the reason for that is because they have epa and dha fats um uh, which are like and basically they, they really help to reduce the prostaglandins uh, and they really support the anti-inflammatory pathways in the body and um, nuts and seeds are good um in moderation obviously but yeah nuts and seeds are good you don't need to be like eating tons of them but like a few bits on on yogurts or a bit of on your porridge for example is good um fruit and vegetables so I know it's, it'd be great to think of like nice fancy foods but it's your basics that are anti-inflammatory fruits vegetables oily fish and um your nuts and seeds coconut oil is um you know you can use that as well I like to recommend grass-fed butter and um, 
as opposed to like the likes of spreads because it contains some fats called uh, conjugated linoleic acid. Um, it's good in Ireland that we can get good real butter here. They are a little bit higher in calories, but um, it depends, I suppose, on your goals. If, you, if you've got hormonal issues, for example, I'd be definitely looking up in your fat intake. And I'm a big fan of real butter as opposed to lab made spreads and um, that don't contain actual you know real food ingredients versus like grass-fed butter so that's just my thoughts on that but again it does depend on your goals so you do need to be if, if you're trying to lose weight and be in a calorie deficit you do need to be moderate of the amount that you're using and put that into your tracking because they are quite high in calories and um, just naturally fats have nine grams of fat and um, versus the other the other macros um do you have any advice for reducing breakout spots during your cycle yeah so it really comes down to looking at your your, your diet here firstly keeping your blood sugar level stable the stable blood sugars can give rise to elevated androgens as well and uh, androgens are what kind of give rise to a bit of a breakout and um, so that could be one thing. So the, the during the later phase of the cycle, your, your progesterone and estrogen start to rise again. So I know I said they dropped, but then they also rise, estrogen drop rises again. And it's this kind of slight fluctuation that can give rise to hormonal issues like your acne, for example. So um, yeah, keeping your blood sugar levels stable and making sure that you're eating lean protein and healthy fats during this phase of the cycle and to be honest throughout the cycle throughout the month not just at that point and um, so that is going to be important reducing your your processed foods uh up in your water intake um let me in terms of if if, if see it sounds like it's just a breakout during your at that end of the cycle so it's not like you've got severe acne or anything like that i'm just making an assumption here based on that question that it sounds like you're just getting at that end it can be a little bit normal to just get a little bit at that time you can add in the likes of spearmint tea for example spearmint tea helps to really uh, lower androgens and um, so for anyone who does suffer with acne and um, or excess hair growth it's taught to reduce the excess androgens that are made due to insulin resistance so it can be a good one to add in as well um yeah anti-inflammatory foods though i'm sorry to keep it boring like unfortunately nutrition is not that exciting it's really like the plain boring stuff that I'm works i'm so glad you said that mary joe because yeah. i think people want me to tell them something different and coming from another nutritionist as long as you're saying that they're all yeah. listening that's two out of two now guys that's two out of two we want a yes or no not a i no. know <laughs> yeah, I it's know. A <laughs> answer. i know i know can i just actually show you a book can you see this yeah this is, if anyone has got hormonal issues, PCOS, severe PMS, I'd recommend this book for anyone. Amanda, you'd love this book as well. Uh, it's just, it's, it's my Bible just for learning about hormones. And she is also uh, making a new one. Uh, she's a new one coming out in February for women who are perimenopausal and menopausal. So I can't wait to read that because it's supportive for me as a pr practitioner, but also for anyone who wants just to learn more about their hormones. So it's a, it's a really good book. Okay, so what? And that's called Period Repair Manual. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, like a question here about tracking when you get into the perimenopausal part of life, cycles start to become less predictable at times. So it becomes more difficult to track which phase you might be in. Yeah, like you might start to notice less fertile mucus. That again is quite common because your estrogen is not as high at this time. And then you're starting to get the declining effects. You're not making as much progesterone as well. Um, it just, like perimenopause, unfortunately, is like nearly a part of life now. <laughs> unfortunately, we have to kind of go through it. But I suppose to make the transition a little bit easier, um, I, I would say some supplements can benefit you like so magnesium is a very beneficial supplement to take for most women I feel it's it's probably one supplement I recommend on a general level for women because I consider it like a, min a miracle supplement or a min miracle mineral in that it um, supports the manufacture of progesterone and it soothes the nervous system so it's um it's a good one for whatever phase you're at whether you're um pre-menopausal or post-menopausal so that'd be something I would look at uh, upping your phytoestrogens so the likes of legumes and um, plant-based things like chickpeas and um, 
uh, flax seeds. Uh, flax seeds are actually great around this time of the cycle because they're they're a good phytoestrogen to, to have in your diet. So they can be really beneficial during perimenopause. But in terms of tracking it, yeah, like it's you're gonna just notice that things start to, to change a little bit. So um you can track your temperature to notice to see if your temperature is rising. Um and uh, that that'd be something you could do to, to, to keep an eye on your if you really want to get to know the cycle um, and or you could just keep an eye on the first time mucus as well and uh, but I know what you're saying that can start to reduce a little bit and get a little bit more um unpredictable at that time but um when it comes to perimenopause and menopausal diets and nutrition it doesn't differ a whole lot from any stage of the cycle it's a mediterranean diet is thought to be most beneficial uh, in that it's high in, in healthy fats and lean proteins a good quality dairy um that kind of thing and then less processed baked fried goods things like that so you really want to be keeping your blood sugar levels stable your insulin levels can be a little bit higher as a result of low estrogen you don't have the sensitizing effects of estrogen anymore so it's important that you're keeping your blood sugar levels very stable to, to kind of soothe yourself through that transition that's what i would say i hope that helps i know again that's like another it, it depends, depends answer but yeah brilliant Guys, any...